Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to have Mark uh, Farber on board. Uh, he is one of the most famous cackles uh, when he refers to doom and gloom and is talking about the great darkness of the macroeconomic setup. Um, he does it with a smile and a laugh. Uh, he recognizes there's bigger things in the world than global economies. Mark, we're really happy to have you. Uh, you were recently canceled as well, so we're delighted to have you. That's another badge of honor uh, in your cap. But I actually grew up grew up seeing quite a few of your appearances, in fact, on uh, the original mainstream media, which seems to have tapered somewhat. How are you doing? Everything is fine. Actually, uh, Bill Fleckenstein and I were one of the first people in the financial sector to be cancelled. So uh, I'm kind of a protagonist of the cancelled movement. <laughs> Good for you. It's a badge of honor, as we already say. We had Jay uh, Powell come on today, and he was, of course, uh, uh, he mentioned the word fragility a little bit. Uh, and I find that very interesting. This was the man who made transitory a key phrase. Uh, and then we started to have the soft landing brigade, then the no landing brigade. And we seem to have, in the last few weeks, lurched very hard back to what you and I have always suspected would be a hard landing. What's your macro take, just generally? What should we be watching and thinking right now in terms of how things are going? Well, uh, the question is, what should we do, is uh, a difficult question to answer. Uh, we would have to analyze first what should have been done to start with, not to get into the problems we have today. And uh, we've had this... Uh, huge debt build up over the years and we had a structure structurally weakening western economies unless the government was throwing money at the system and uh, through fiscal deficits and uh, you can be sure and you can look it up through all the history books all inflations came from fiscal spending that demanded money printing or borrowing from foreign countries and so forth. So the uh, connection between fiscal deficit, money printing, and then uh, rising inflation is clearly established. Now yeah. you may say, well, Mark, we have one example where this wasn't true, uh, Japan. This is to some extent uh, correct, but I challenge uh, the government statistics in Japan because whenever you travel to Japan, you will be shocked by the high price level and especially high prices compared to the rest of Asia. So uh, you take a taxi from the airport in Japan to the city, it will be 150 to 170 US dollar. He understand the prices have gone up, but it don't show up in the Japanese CPI, and the cost of living is relatively high in in Tokyo, especially if you pay tax there. So all I want to say is, we have to be very careful with government statistics, because uh, statistics uh, are usually a lie. This has been yeah. established for the centuries, and you can manipulate statistics easily. Uh, this economy is also no. So the, uh, but the, in, in general, yeah, and I also like to point out, Japan has a contracting population. You know? Demographic. Actually, in 2022, the Japanese population contracted was reduced by about 700,000 people. I mean, this is a big percentage decline. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't think that uh, it is a disaster, a population decline, uh, unless you want to go to war, and then you need a lot of people. But for a country, uh, the per capita incomes can go up when the population <laughs> decline. Yeah. During the Black Death, when uh, the per, when the population of Europe declined by about thirty percent, 
the per capita incomes of workers went up because there was a worker shortage. Yeah. Yeah, they're having 0.91 children, only lower by the only other country that's lower is South Korea at 0.88. So that's not even replacement right. of, of one full parent, never mind two parents. So, uh, that is a big contraction. Uh, so that will have an effect on inflation. Um, and I think they sell more adult nappies than baby nappies as well. So you also have that life cycle. Many people say they're 11 years ahead of the boomer generation in America. So they are even more um, elderly and the elderly are retired and live off savings. And unfortunately, many of them have their savings in, according to their culture, the ladies buying the Japanese uh, bonds uh, market, which is now very strongly owned. Uh, which is far from the best uh, asset class, isn't it? Uh, what's your take on the debt and with reference to Japan as well? Well, I have friends who are educated and still at, you know, like Hoover Institutes and all these NGOs and uh, all kind of academic institutes. They've written for the last 25 years that Japan will go bust because of their horrible fiscal uh, situation. It hasn't happened yet, but uh, something will give. You understand? They they control interest rates. Uh, they keep the 10 years yield. Uh, they increase it to 0.5%, yes. but it's still enormously low. So... In theory, the currency should go down or this 0.5% uh, level of interest rates will break on the upside. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Japanese inflation rate, it's also now officially by Japanese statistics is also above 3%. And yeah, mid 4.3. Yeah. Yes. And that's a lie number. That's the the lie, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look at, uh, I mean, I'm not an academic, I'm a businessman and I run my business and so forth. But even a half-educated person should see that governments have never lied more than today. It's a complete yeah. lie. A complete, yeah. but everywhere. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, now we have a perfect example, this COVID business. Mm. Gradually, the truth comes out. But as my friend, Fernando Del Pino wrote in an essay, he said, nobody will ever be responsible for it. Nobody will go to jail. Yeah. Yeah. Now they got the lie to run around the planet 20 times before we even start to get the inkling that our original guidance was correct. Uh, we, we got quite a lot of that on Matt Hancock in the UK in terms of, I don't know how whether you've been keeping up with that. You sound like you're quite well aware. But where he's admitting in WhatsApp chats with other politicians about creating fear and, and launching the new uh, variant and various other concepts. So the, the, the whole stage management is that we suggested was in existence is, is, is the curtains being pulled back uh, and all the conspiracy theorists are, are right. Um, just taking it back to the economic though. So Japan, surely the USD, J, J, well, the yen must be one of the most compromised uh, currencies. Either the rates go up or the currency or both or a degree of both must be one of the most fa fatally flawed uh, currencies at the moment of all. I mean, this is a relative game in an ugly basket. Yes, but I'm always open to listen to other, uh, let's say, probabilities or uh, options. I mean, in theory, I could come to you and argue Japan is now the perfect example of a complete failure of fiscal and monetary policy to lift GDP growth and to improve economic conditions. I mean, because the Keynesian will always tell you, fiscal spending will boost economic activity, 
Money printing will uh, lift economic activity. And every crisis we had in the last hundred years or so, after the acceptance by American economists of Keynesian theories as the main uh, theory in economics, and which essentially entails interventionism. I'm against yes. any intervention, but this is the philosophy behind uh, Keynesian is the interventions by the government because the market doesn't function well enough. Well, the yeah. market doesn't function always w very well, but it functions better some than some idiots like this Hancock you were just referring to and this Baerbock in Germany and Aether in New Zealand and all these clowns, you understand? The market is formed or the price is formed by people that are reasonably well informed about what they buy and what they sell. And it's a vote, it's a democratic process. In other words, yeah. uh, they buy a stock, the buyers buy and they pay the price and the sellers sell because so, so and so. So in a way, the interventions are already an infringement into a democratic process. It's communism, actually, because capitalism is meant to be price discovery system, a free market price discovery precisely, system. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. But we had this interventions by the communists that were on site. And it's been, uh, it's interesting to think about who actually benefits from all this. I mean, there must be some beneficiaries. Of course, power corrupts people and uh, there are some uh, pathological, uh, power-hungry people around. But it, in general, it benefits one group in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, w uh, during this period of interventionism, the, instead of getting a lower volatility economic, we've had ever stronger boom and bust cycles and ever greater wealth created for the 1% that seem to have unlimited access to credit at the lows and never get shaken out, whilst the majority of people end up buying the the highs and being shaken out on the induced crashes. So it's a, people talk about in crypto markets, the very simple everyday hucksters uh, pump and dump scam, but actually central banking is the original mega pump and dump uh, scam, create excess liquidity cause a mania, get all the retail market to chase in in the final third, make them bag holders for the dip and take it back off them at a third of the price later for pennies in the pound um, and rinse and repeat cycle uh, to ensure the genie curve gets as hollowed as it possibly can so that the 1% are holding uh, the 80% of the wealth. You are right. But I have to also point out that what you're saying, and what I believe as well, that actually the the system has been rigged to the benefit of a few at the expense of the many. But the yes. one person that really uh, pointed this out in numerous lectures already in the 70s was Milton Friedman. And yes. I recommend your viewers to regain some of their sanity to Google on YouTube Milton Friedman. And yeah. there they can listen to several lectures, some only last 10 minutes and some last an hour. But he's a brilliant uh, proponent of the theory that basically the politicians help themselves and uh, have impoverished the majority of people. And there are other people like uh, Thomas Sowell who have similar views. Uh, there was an economist called Williams. He was also black. I don't know whether it's still politically correct to call someone black or whether you need to call him an African-American uh, intellectual, <laughs> whatever yeah. it is. But the point is, uh, it's interesting that some people are waking up to this but it's such a tiny majority, and uh, the majority of people listens to speeches of people like Harris 
and of Biden and I mean totally irrelevant people intellectually and also in a hundred years nobody will talk about these people they're uh, oh, irrelevant yeah books I'm not sure there still be history books in a hundred years <laughs> That is another story. Yeah. Well, while you have a cackle on that one and grab a ciggy, uh, there's actually some interesting on books. Uh, a number of people, including Andreessen, the man behind Skype, who's in tech, is telling everybody, uh, and there's been other people that have highlighted this, James Corbett as well, that um, you should buy physical books. They've now um, edited and dropped into people's digital versions of certain stories the politically correct uh, versions, version twos, that have actually corrected various fattest and transphobic and other crimes of child writers that have been perceived and since uh, identified, which include, I expect, Harry Potter and various other things that she might have said uh, in her writings. And they're actually, without your consent, updating it to the new language. And that language, which Jordan Peterson deserves credit for highlighting, Language is actually uh, a control mechanism because it's what you orate. Uh, and by controlling oration and you have to think about what you say, it's actually mind control too. Uh, and he refused to be pulled up as a criminal for not knowing uh, any individual's uh, pronouns uh, and that they could actually inflict this potential hazard for him where he would have committed a microaggression for not knowing that. So you're absolutely right. Uh, who knows what will be available in books by hard copy. And in fact, it's anti digital I'm anti-digitization everything. Our freedoms are going to be stripped, utilizing internet and digitization, digital money, digital everything. Gold is hard copy book uh, in terms of hard copy money. And uh, you brought this point up and I'm in, in developing it out. Having a physical book is still going to have the same text 100 years from now. Uh, and there's no guarantee of that uh, in the digital realm. Yes, I think that this is true. And I'm glad because I have a large book collection of first edition of Economist. And I also have old encyclopedias where they don't apply the politically correct uh, language. And all <laughs> the old history books like Toynbee or... Uh, Will Durand, uh, they would be politically completely uh, incorrect nowadays. <laughs> yeah. The world has gone mad. I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable. It has indeed. It has indeed. So, for the people that are going to be watching us and say, yep, we're on board, we get it, two characters having a good cackle about the craziness of the society, but what do we do? Uh, in terms of how do we position. Now, we know that precious metal plays a role in that, and I'm sure you'll develop it out. But how else? Once you've gold it out, I mean, most people, you know, we all think 5% is a rather low number. I don't stay within constraints. I think at the end of a particular cycle, being overweight significantly is not a problem if you still have youth and risk profile. So I'm overweight precious metals. But what else do you do? Yes, you have some cash maybe and maybe some minor equities which could expose you or other commodities. Um, what's your take? How should people positioning? If, you, if, you, if you've got the $100,000 portfolio, how much should that, just broad stroke, on a non-advisory basis, we are stressed, just a model, a couple ideas you would throw out. Yes, uh, I will return to this question after one minute in which sure. i want to say to your first question what should we do yeah well you pointed out in your introduction to this video about the fear that was a uh, kind of spread uh, by this including hancock into people yeah. when people are fearful and i was just moved, watching a movie called terror in a city in Texas. It's an old Western movie with uh, uh, it is, what is what was his name? Anyway, it will come back to my mind. But it's a good movie. It wasn't recognized very well at the beginning because they don't shoot a lot. But it yeah. has a very 
great moral story of people when they're under fear, they don't speak out anymore. Yeah. And I have noticed this with many of my friends in the US. They're not giving their opinions anymore because they're afraid that the IRS will walk into their doors the next day. Or uh, a friend of mine, he lives in Thailand and he finances, uh, I mean, he's a donor to the AFD. The AFD in Germany has nothing to do with na Nazis and so forth. And, uh, but he's a, in the view of the communist, socialist, green, and so forth, the AFD is far right when it is yeah. in the center. Yeah. Now, he is a donor there. Now, he met the ambassador in uh, the new ambassador of Germany in Bangkok. He said to him, look, I invite you for dinner to my house because he has a very nice, luxurious staff. And, uh, you know, he lives in style because he's very wealthy. So the ambassador first said, yes, I mean, but then he canceled on short notice because he was afraid to be seen with uh, someone who is a donor to the AFD. This is mm. fear of people to expose themselves. And when you ask, you know, what should we do? We have to fight and we have to point out that the government leaders we have nowadays are a complete disaster. They've been put in place by someone. I don't know who they are, the people that put in place this government official. But they're all puppets, including Trump was a puppet. All of them. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that has to be pointed out that our responsibility is to fight against these people. Yeah. And number two, concerning the portfolio, I think, and I've just written about this, about various scenarios, and the scenario under which we are nowadays, which may not officially be a war scenario, but is coming close to it because we have uh, state sanctions, sanctions, expropriations. You understand, in Switzerland, we're a neutral country. They froze the accounts of the Russians. Well, you know, not every Russian is a good supporter and not every Russian is evil. Although the Western media wants to paint the Russians as someone totally different. When they had the same culture as we Western Europeans in terms of literature, in terms of music, and in terms of Christianity, they just don't acknowledge the Pope, but other <laughs> they are Christians. Yeah, right. Orthodox Christians were persecuted very real. Yeah, I was trying. Orthodox Christians that were persecuted terribly, and the West looked the other way when it happened as well. If anything, we owe them uh, as uh, almost victims of a terrible experiment that was very PTSD for their general culture as well, because they went to being sullen, secretive after the Stasi and everything they were exposed to. We uh, we should be inviting them in and uh, you know bringing them out their shells and helping them on. I'll also tell you just one other quick story before you go back. Uh, you mentioned how we need more courage. And I got a guy on my Twitter profile who said, you know, you're the best technical analyst that I love uh, following you, but I, I could just do without all the politics that you put out and everything else. And uh, my response is, that's almost the most important part. You know, I don't, you would have 10 times more followers, he said, if you just didn't put these posts in there as well. And my feeling is, I don't want 10 times more normies who are all cowards on my name. I want activists. <laughs> I want people that make some noise and push back. Uh, people that just care for the share trading up on the day or what technically is moved for now. And they don't see the bigger game are actually part of the problem. Their inertia and their fear, like the fear you described of not going to dinner with someone who is perceived badly, is a massive problem. And we have to we have to cajole the warrior spirit and people putting themselves out there a little bit more and standing up because we more I'm reminded you spoke of films by the way I think your actor you were thinking of was Sterling Hayden in uh, um, yeah, Texas. Sterling Hayden 
that's right. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking of a, of a film uh, which has an equally long ago, uh, and I watched it as a very small boy, um, but I'm sure you'll know it, uh, Spartacus. We need more people to stand up and say, I Spartacus, that was Kurt Russell, um, the father of um, the Russell we later got to know. Um, and, you know, we need more people to say, I Spartacus, uh, when they, the Romans, I think it was, who were asking for, uh, who is uh, Spartacus? We need everybody to stand up. Um, and I'm afraid if you stood up, you'd be the only one and everybody else would sit around and look in their hands and hang their heads and say, good, he'll be crucified and I'll just hang on for a few more days and live in my slavery. And we, the, the, it's the cowardice that is out there as well right. in terms of looking back. Indifference. Uh, but I... I will come to the hundred thousand dollar portfolio in a second, yep. but I just want to point out my sense is that when the wealthy people in Europe and the US will lose half their money, then they'll get the shock and they'll get incentivized to do something. You understand? As long as the portfolio only goes down 10, 20%. They have so much money, they don't care, really. I mean, they care. I know how rich people think because I've dealt with some all my life and that was yeah. so reasonably wealthy. But uh, until someone really moves, it has to hurt. You know, it's like I'm a smoker. Until I really get sick, I will continue to smoke. No. I drink a lot. Until I really get sick, I continue drinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, they need real pain. But I want to get now go go to the hundred thousand dollar portfolio. As I wrote, I think we are in a situation where, first of all, we have to think how to invest, and uh, is the investment to make a lot of money or is the investment to preserve what we have? So. At my age, <laughs> I'm more keener to preserve what I have than to make a lot. Because at 77 years of age, uh, if you haven't made any money yet, it is unlikely that you will make a lot in the last 10% uh, of your life. And I'm not that optimistic. I think I'm in the last 5%. But uh, then the preservation of capital becomes important. And if you're young, you say to yourself, how did wealthy people in America and Europe become rich? Usually through land ownership, because they didn't do anything more stupid with the money. It mm. kept them into something. It kept them away from day trade. Let's put it this way. And you <laughs> pointed out the system is rigged. Do you think that the stock market is a mechanism to take it away from the rich people, from the politicians, and hand it over to the poor people? It's a complete fake. It is designed to collect the money from poor people and channel it legally and illegally. The, of course, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is an institution formed by idealists to protect individual investors. That was maybe the ideology, but it's changed to protect the wealthy people. For instance, uh, the Robin Hood platform and Schwab and so forth, they sell the order flow to hedge funds. I mean, yeah. I think no clear example of uh, a rigged market if you sell the order flow to someone else. In the 70s and 60s, and I mean, since the beginning of the stock market, we had the specialist system. The specialists were always attacked because they saw the order flow. They had to yeah. buy limits and sell limits by the, uh, by the speculators and the investors. So people always said, oh, the specialist is a money-making machine because they know the order flow. Yeah. Yeah, but it's insider information and they make the spreads as well. So when they want to show panic, they can just pull and drop and shake people out. They know how leveraged they are. They know where they have to move something to harvest 
Uh, it's as you say, it's a rigged game. Robin Hood is the most extreme version. But even before Robin Hood, I was aware of all these MT4 brokers. Uh, they selling of order flow. In fact, they want to keep it in the house. And in the UK and Europe, they said you can't do it. So a couple of them set up instead of selling the order flow to others, they set up offshore entities with different names, and they bought and provided. And actually, it was still a company they controlled. So they want to be the other side of what they see as the dumbest money in the world, which is retail. They throw you leverage, which is a bit like giving a baby in a cot uh, a nine mil with a hairline trigger. And you see you come and look at the kindergarten a little bit later and see what carnage you've created there as all these babies have been uh, shooting each other. Uh, that is in essence, uh, that is in essence how the, the manufactured, the perfect formula for... Uh, manifesting a carnage that you benefit from. You have lots of fresh organs to donate uh, to the organ donor society if you create that situation without having to have shot anybody yourself. Um, so it's a very well orchestrated rig. Um, it's fascinating. Go back to the 100,000 though. Let's, so let me answer the question. Let's assume that uh, defense is the primary key. And I do think when you get to end of the cycle, defense is actually the best attack portfolio. Because so many things are going to uh, crash by just not being part of the crash. In the entire foundation of the valuation, which is fiat-based, is going to crash. So just not going down with that is actually a wealth enhancement uh, game that will carry you very well. So I'm happy with defense uh, being quite a good form of attack in this end-of-cycle times. Um, so if you were defensive and you're in your... And you don't look a day above 57, by the way, and you've got 20 more years to go... Uh, at least. But uh, on that basis, uh, defend your portfolio through this transition and tell me we all mix of assets uh, and percentages. Yes. Uh, I'll come to the mix of assets in one minute. But one minute I have to say, the first question is uh, that investors frequently overlook. Where do I hold my wells? Because I have seen... Uh, the Russian Revolution, I mean, I haven't seen it physically, but I've uh, read about it, and I read about, and I know firsthand, because friends of mine, they belonged among, to the, among richest Germans, and they lost everything because their land holdings were in today's Czech Republic. So yeah. when the partition came, it was in the Russian part, <laughs> that all went uh, boom. And I know many Shanghainese in Hong Kong, their parents belonged, among others, uh, to the richest people in Shanghai. They lost everything because they believed in Shanghai, they believed in China, whereas others, they had moved some of their money to Hong Kong already and some to actually America. I mean, the Chiang Kai-shek family, the Sung sisters and so forth, they all had money in America, and a lot of it, and a lot of it, but not everybody. So uh, the point is, where do I keep the custody of my assets? And I suggest some diversification. I don't well, want to have anything in America and in Great Britain, Canada, and Australia. These are, for me, the vulnerable countries, uh, because they're all one and the same. Yeah. But uh, if I were an American, I would say I have at least half my money outside the U.S. in other jurisdictions. It's that uh, if you buy in America and you have a Merrill Lynch account or whatever account, and you buy stocks in Hong Kong, but the the custody is still in uh, America, is no use. You would have to open an account in Asia and buy these shares out of Asia, then uh, the custody is under a different sovereign nation. I mean, I don't want to give advice here, but I, I suppose that Singapore would be a reasonable place to hold some assets. Yes. I agree. To the asset allocation. I mean, I'm not as smart as the hedge fund managers all are, uh, but I would suggest, of course, to hold some precious metals. I'm not a wild bull on precious metals, 
but I think it's a safe investment to hold in the long run. I'm not buying in the morning and selling in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, I'm a bit surprised by the weakness in precious metals because I think they should be higher than they are at the present time. But I can live with that. Uh, at the side, but the disadvantage of precious metals is they don't provide you with a cash flow. And I'm a cash flow person. Yeah. So I like... Uh, I like bonds, but not necessarily treasuries. Uh, it depends. Uh, if I look back at the treasury market in the 70s, okay, which is, I'm talking here about, say, the 10 years treasury. It started at 6% in 1970, then it rose sharply uh, in yields, and then it fell by about 50% in yields. And then it rose again into 1979, then it fell again, and then it rose in the peak in 1981. What I want to say, interest rates never go straight up, and they never go straight down. There was big swings, and these interest rate swings, they last, I mean, normally around 25, 30 years. But the last one, because there was manipulation by the central banks, the downdraft in uh, inflation and in interest rate uh, began in 1981 and it uh, ended essentially in May 2020 when the 10 years uh, reached an artificial low of 0.57% courtesy of the manipulation by central banks in the case of the US the Federal Reserve. I mean, if an individual would manipulate the market as badly as the Fed and other central banks, it would be in jail. Yeah. yeah. This is the institutionalization of crime. <laughs> yeah. The same yeah. as the ECB. ECB is run by a lady who has no clue about economics. She's a third class a lawyer who worked for Baker McKenzie and then somehow propelled. She was again by the system propelled up upward. Nobody knows why. Because well, she had to control, which was quite a good qualification for being controlled. Uh, she committed a fraud that was provable that she was even found guilty of, of course. Uh, so it's very useful to have someone. Uh, where you can have the files reopened if they don't behave. Uh, and I think that's something that's held over her head. But as you said, she has no qualifications for um, central banking. Um, just but on that. You're right. Fraud is a qualification to be promoted yeah. among politicians. Yeah. If you want to be a politician, the best is probably to join first a, a, a cartel in Mexico. There you learn how to to, to, success, to eliminate your rivals. That's right. Uh, that's right. But anyway, if we talked about cycle, just to push back on the bonds uh, thing. What about? I mean, if for your bonds, what if I counter propose a retail um, home in a non-Western society. So let's say a good area in Latin America, Uruguay, nice town, nice street with rental income. Um, because, and I'll just counter as it, mainly for the art of the discussion, debt markets, they're going to enter a new system. They are hopelessly over-indebted. One of the perfect or best things for them would be to lose all the debt in the birthing canal of the new system and thereby they kill the asset as well as the liability. They get to start again. It's kind of, I, I owe a lot of money, but we say, let's all cancel everybody's debts. Let's burn it. And I'm the main beneficiary, which is kind of how it is. And then we have a new system and we'll even cancel your debts. It's like a gift to you. Meanwhile, you owe little bits of nothing in truth compared to the larger uh, cartels, uh, as we've called them, um, very much like the Mexican drug cartels, as you've uh, paralleled. Uh, and they get they get to start anew, and that has an entire new generation, a fresh setup. So that asset then dies. And my argument is because we're in this 
final stage where we're birthing a new system that they have intended and planned and had in their mind's eye for a long, long time. That debt, that debt could go to absolutely zero and you might get in-kind assets of UBI type claim that will be pretty menial and peasantry because most of that debt's held either by governments or by pensioners and both of which they're happy to lumber, cancel and move on and make very small peppercorn contributions out of whatever new system. So on that basis, are you not challenged? Let's say it's 25% each way uh, or 100 uh, grand. So we've got 25% metals as insurance and you're proposing 25% bonds. And I'm counter proposing a property in a likely to remain not too communist where property rights will remain ob uh, observed. Um, and that is the current that is a total order. Where it is, it is, I know, yes. Uh, but but, but, but I'd like to mention in my asset allocation, I have 25% in precious metals, 25% in bonds and cash. 25% in equities and 25% in real estate. Now you okay. say, well, with 100,000, 25% in real estate is 25,000. You can't find a house for that uh, anywhere. Uh, that is to some extent true. But even with 100,000, I tell you, you're not going to get a nice house anywhere in the world. I live in a country where real estate is relatively inexpensive. I mean, someone with a hundred thousand, that would be essentially a uh, three million baht. He could probably buy a house, but whether that house will appreciate because the real estate developer already has a huge margin on it that. and the quality of the building is not particularly good. So I'm not entirely sure that this would be a good investment. Now, is the question going to live in that house? Is it a good measure? Well, it depends on your financial position. But if you're a pensioner in Europe or in America and you have a limited social security payment, yeah. say a thousand dollars a month, you can't live in the US with that, but you could no. live in your hundred thousand dollar house in Thailand with it. Yeah. Not well, not in luxury. Uh, that I have to point out. So, so let's let's make it another zero. Let's say it's a million, and you put two hundred and fifty thousand in metals. You put uh, yeah. you've got two hundred and fifty thousand now. Two hundred fifty thousand in a, in a property, and uh, what I said, where you hold your assets, I would, you know, diversify outside the U.S. So I would have some equi equities outside the U.S and some properties outside the U.S. But uh, it is interesting that the cheapest properties at the present time I can think of are properties in small villages in Europe, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, even in Switzerland, because some villages have been sort of abandoned. You know what uh, There was no business left. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, it, they almost give you a house. Of course, you have to then say that you will redecorate it and uh, undertake some work. But if you're physically halfway fit, you can do a lot yourself. And if you say, well, I don't know, then you better learn uh, as you go along. Uh, yeah. As long as you can use the internet, uh, there are lots of courses about how to do things. I'm not Indeed. very good at earning these things, but uh, I also do some manual work because I happen to like to do manual work. Yeah. So I would but... buy a house outside the U.S. and then we come, uh, and then the question is, do you buy, if you have money in Singapore or in a, a capital city like London, Munich, Brussels, uh, then we can establish a list. Where do I not buy at all? I mean, the worst buys and the best buys. <laughs> They're yeah. short sales. I would imagine in case of a war scenario, a good short sale is real estate in the neighborhood of the NATO head office in Brussels. Yeah. Not a, not a good price. 
that is, and I would let them go and live there. A, because Brussels is very expensive and has a huge crime rate. <laughs> that is another factor. Yeah. But in small villages in general, you see, I think the world is changing in some sense that for the last 200 years in the history of the world, is essentially from the start of humankind, we have nomades, and then a big invention in civilization is sedentary uh, people. In other words, they build cities. Now, we yeah. are sure did they build the cities first and became religious later, or did they become religious? And were religious sites first, and then they built the cities around the religious sites. We don't know, but it happened. And then the cities essentially grew, but they grew a lot in the last 200 years. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the size of American cities in 1800, they're all very small. No city had more than uh, 20,000 people in 1800. But then they grew up to go. Anyway, now we could be at the time. The internet permits me to sit in Chiang Mai, it's in the north of Thailand. It's uh, by world standards a small city. In Thailand, it's the second largest city or third largest city. Because here in, uh, in Asia, nobody knows the size of the populations. But, but I can. Uh, I can uh, use the internet at Bloomberg here uh, on my Bloomberg channel and I have the news at the same speed yet, like you had when you came on this evening you asked me uh, did you hear the speech of power I didn't hear it because I don't listen to Fed officials uh, but Bloomberg then reports what they said and so forth it's a waste of time for me to listen to uneducated uh, Criminals, you know, eleven people without any charisma, no qualifications. It's uh, unbelievable. None of these clowns has ever worked in the private sector. It's a complete disaster. But yeah. this is socialism, and I'm glad we're going to have socialism until people will wake up. What misery socialism will bring upon them. And yeah. You know, the CNBC people and the CNN people and all these TV guys, they all are leftists and the people at universities ditto. But again, they are all fearful of losing their jobs because they are well paid. This is the corruption of the system. You bribe people through I pay. Yeah, play the game. Nothing more says that than Hillary Clinton's going rate for speeches to Goldman Sachs. She's, I find her a very dull, rather uninspiring speech writer, but I'm obviously missing something because I think she gets about half a million a shot for an hour. <laughs> so I, I'm clearly missing all the enigmatic humor, this brilliance and this uh, insight that uh, Goldman Sachs and the likes seem to be uh, finding great value in. I must not try. You, know, you understand? Yeah. I perfectly uh, agree with you. But in theory, the audience, the clients of Goldman Sachs should complain. Uh, yeah. You understand? It's like we have uh, governments, but the voters voted for them in theory. Uh, so. Uh, there's something wrong with the population and the financial sector has been bribed by the central banks because you understand as long as you print money portfolios will go up in value and every fund manager will make more and more money they love it the financial yeah. sector loves money printing and I've been you know condemning money printing for the last 30 years but all my financial friends and so forth, they all turned to me and said, look, Mike, <laughs> we may agree with you, but the stock market goes up. It's better for us and we feel happier. And I tell them, yes, 
I also become wealthier because the stock market goes up, but it's all illusionary wealth. And uh, it's as an economist and as a social observer, uh, it, has a, it is a complete unjust system. Unfair. 100% unfair. unfair. But the financial sector is silent. They, they pay Goldman Sachs the fees to invite Hillary Clinton. <laughs> they should pay Goldman Sachs not to have her. Correct. Correct. I would prefer that myself as well. Um, so we're going to choose. Let's go back to, so I said, the cheapest real estate at the moment is, uh, okay, it's in socialist countries like Europe, but in small villages, uh, the village spirit is uh, higher than the central authorities. But I want to point out another point about investing overseas and in the U.S. I have in the U.S. Uh, very wealthy people, I mean, in the billion dollar league. You know what they did about their investments? They themselves vanished. They vanished from the sea. No Facebook account, no publicity, zero. And they disappeared. Nobody knows who they are. I happen to know because I'm a friend with them and so forth. But otherwise, and I asked them, and one is a security expert. I mean, uh, internet security and uh, computer security. He, I asked him, what is the best not to get hacked and so forth? He said, Mark, you disappear. Yeah. Don't have I, I, social media accounts. Don't make, don't uh, let yourself be quoted. Don't go into anything. So then you're relatively safe. Go completely dark. Go off internet, go totally remote. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I've even thought about it. Fake your own death and have a new name. Uh, it's almost. It's almost like you need a rebirth and take whatever you have it's with been you. Done repeatedly. Just ask the old Nazis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry. I, normally, it doesn't happen because I doesn't see that nobody. No, no, we will hit it about. Someone called the number, and it was the wrong number. <laughs> they looked for Tasha. <laughs> uh, I also like well, I ho hope we find her. <laughs> she sounds pretty. Uh, uh, yes, so I'm going to go for uh, a, a quarter of a million uh, Thailand house, live in the same suburb as you. Uh, when I'm not there, I will rent it out. I'm going to have, I think I'll have a quarter of a million in cash. I'm not going to go for the bonds. I like that. Uh, I will buy property when it collapses, maybe more or maybe some more gold when the paper price comes down with this potential depression because we've got we haven't even addressed the Fed's fragility. Suddenly they it feels to me like they're establishing an alibi now so that they can say, well, we did tell you so. You know, they now he's talking fragility after, you know, he's upping rates after, he, 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 you know, he created so much money. We also, funny enough, a little factoid on our Japanese discussion. One of the biggest recipients of Fed repo loans was three trillion for Numura, a Japanese uh, bank. So they were one of the biggest recipients of the 2019 going into 20 events and repo for market failures. And they really got sent a lot of money um, by them. So we will speculate maybe on some shorts, a little bit of speculation pot, but not too much. Uh, we'll have 25% gold and... Um, what was the fourth one? Real estate. We'll, well, we, we've done real estate. We've done cash. We've done gold and equities. So in terms of the geographies, equities, Singapore-based listings maybe, and not American unless we're choosing mining sector, for example. Is that is that a sensible thing? So I've got my, help me spend my $250,000 on shares, which geogra geography and then which industries, because we're actually seeing quite a lot of strength on military industrial complex shares at the moment. And we've seen America giving all their old armory now on such industrial scale for this proxy war. They've literally sent everything that isn't cutting edge now to Poland. Poland's sitting there. It's almost like those, I don't know if you remember those beautiful movies where they'd have those graveyards of planes. 
uh, in the Arizona desert. It's almost like, okay, pack all that stuff off. We've got a pl- we've got a buyer. You know, send it, send it over, send it over, and they, they're going to be sending you know uh, catapults and uh, two, you know uh, what we used to call peace shooters over soon to the Ukrainians to uh, kill the Russian bear. But all this stuff is going off. So I'm assuming there's going to be a massive reinvestment on the cutting edge technology on restocking on armaments uh, because Europe has done the same and they haven't had any wars to fight officially anyway. So ammunition actually has a sell by date. It's not good forever. Uh, And all of these things are being bundled off. So I'm expecting you could actually have longs on the military industrial complex. And, And there's also the war on us, which they seem to have no end of money to wage. I go to South Africa or Zimbabwe and they can't even uh, tarmac a road. But when you go through the airport, they've got the latest and greatest biometric face scanning, passport scanning. Look into my eyes, look into my eyes, the whole shooting match. Isn't it, isn't it ironic? Uh, give us your, your cigarette box response to <laughs> that. Well, uh, first of all, we have to decide in which countries we want to invest. And I mean, even American, of course, I will invest some money in America. As a foreigner, uh, there is some risk in investing in America in terms of estate duties. I have some American holdings, but uh, basically uh, I want to sell them before I die. So I hope I don't, won't have a heart attack tonight. But <laughs> I feel reasonably well. But, uh, uh, but say, as an international investor, let's say we could invest, say, 50% in the U.S. and 50% overseas. And I want to explain why I think this is a reasonably fair assumption. The U.S. with 330 million people, uh, half of them they can't read and write, but nevertheless, there's still 330 million, they are 50% of the stock market capitalization of the world, still. Japan, in 1989, was also 50% of the world. Now they're less than 10% of the world. And as you know, uh, over the last uh, 40 years, uh, notably over the last 25 years, the U.S., share of world GDP has gone down. It's not the US GDP which has gone down, but as a percentage of the world, because we had the explosive rise in China, uh, where the industrial production today is larger than in the US. The cement production of China is the loan larger than all the other cement production in the world. So I just want to say, in China, we have big companies and big industries and big consumption and big markets. And yeah. in India, it's the same. Uh, you understand? So I want to have money parked in the part of the world that, in my view, is at the lower level of uh, standards of living, but is rising. And no. Whatever the U.S. media tells you, and I would be very careful to believe everything, but they cannot deny that the average Chinese, as well as the average Russian and average Indian, is today much better off than 25 years ago. Nobody denies that. Not even the poor people. Nobody denies that. And this happened, why? Because these countries went from a strict socialist planning economy to a capitalistic system. And yet, idiots, especially among young people, they want more government intervention. They want socialism. It's actually hard to believe when the evidence is here on everybody's desk that the moment countries move from socialism to capitalism, the economies exploded on the upside. Yep. Yep, that's absolutely true. They're not totally pure capitalistic nations. No, no one really is nowadays. 
but they've made steps in that direction and America is making steps in the opposite direction. Uh, and it does seem like the, the ivory towers of academia is the attack vector for making Karl Marx cool again. Uh, and that's, that is quite some trick that they're managing to pull. Yes, he wasn't a cool guy and he wasn't a nice person in uh, yeah. any way. Uh, he was uh, highly intellectual and to be fair to him, he could have made uh, money, I suppose, uh, but he chose to write, I mean, out of his books, uh, they're incredibly uh, detailed, I mean, a very uh, detailed analysis. It is wrong, as Schumpeter showed, but he was very conscientious person, hard working. But I mean, uh, uh, certainly not a nice person, and certainly not. Uh, it, it's uh, Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher uh, who became uh, well known in the early part of the 20th century. He was interviewed in 1950 or so about, uh, they asked him, well, you know, do you regard it as one of the big philosophers and so forth? And uh, who do you think is another important philosopher over the last hundred years? He said, undoubtedly, undoubtedly Karl Marx. But he pointed out that uh, Marx is not a nice philosophy. It is a philosophy of disruption and of yeah. hate. And this yeah. we have to see very clearly among the socialists. Uh, go to any socialist country. It's very little creation. It's more about destruction of wealth that has been built up, redistributing what you have. Capitalism, I agree, is a undoubtedly the best system to create wealth in a society. No question about this. It's historically proven. Uh, socialism uh, has, 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 has a, an aim to distribute, but it fails at distributing because uh, in order to make be, uh, uh, say an equal system, you have to cut down the tall trees. You have to cut down the wealthy people. And the most wealthy people, to be fair, you look at Sam Walton, you look at Marcus of Home Depot and so forth. These people, they work their ass off. We have to acknowledge that. And Milton Friedman, that's why I said you should li listen to his lecture. He said he's a myth that the robber parents enrich themselves only at the expense of the people. The people in America benefited even up to this day from the construction of railroad. It benefited people. They could get food cheaper. The farmers could ship food from the countryside to the cities and so on. I mean, that people don't see that, that the, the, the capitalists uh, in those days, the whole canal was a huge advance. The invention of the refrigerator, of running wood, all these things were incredible. But it was capitalists that did it. Of course, the capitalists became rich, but it also benefited society. Transportation costs well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the whole aspect of entrepreneurship is a creation of service and value add. And the more people you serve, the wealthier you get. Um, as yeah, much as I... the more government you have, the poorer you will be, because the government, as we discussed and as we shown, promotes stupidity to the top. And socialism, where they are an elite class, and they eventually tend towards a greatly leveled peasants class of serfdom, where it, <laughs> and you go from a multi-class system to a two-class system, an insider Bolshevik and uh, serfs. Uh, because they they the Congress union. Yeah, it's exactly. Union in America, they should make compulsory reading of Animal Farm. 
Okay. I would also add uh, Ayn Rand from uh, the Russian female, and I, I don't know why the Me Too movement doesn't make uh, much of this woman. It's almost like she's resented, but this is a female who wrote wisely on Atlas Shrugged, and we are in that bifurcation of the productive people leaving all the social engineers in one world and realm that keep taxing and breaking and the political expediency and wokeism. She's literally predicted everything that's happening now and how the productive people withdraw. And the interesting part of this, and uh, just just going, and I love the portfolio because it set up the the structure of this discussion, but I would even say positioning for the future, I would not do any American allocation apart from military industrial complex for short, medium term, and any miners that were attractive in terms of the commodity play. And the goal long term after a certain degree of up upside, say four or five years, to take that to wind down that American portfolio. Because the, the stock market is actually an evil machine to the social engineers. In the, after a while, they start to think we should have a happiness index f instead of a capitalistic exploit like this where you have prices. Uh, and, and, you know, where does the insanity stop? So I would slowly retreat into other nations that are still maintaining family values, many of them Islamic, the Dubai, the, that axis, and Singapore, uh, where the businesses are, where the demographics are great. So the Indonesians will have a great demographic cycle coming. They, I think last time I checked, they were 27 average age when we were 46. So they're about 10 years, 15 years behind and much bigger population and growing, uh, maybe big growth businesses there and or China listed in Singapore. Um, and the industries, well, maybe we have to start looking at the base industries again because we're going to have insanity in the West. The financial engineering will break up. Maybe it's time to be agricultural for a bit, uh, commodity orientated, and then pivot back into technology at some point. I don't know, how do you What's your comeback uh, on that? And the trend of America is worrying. And uh, do you know, we, America, the premium in America was smart people that could be paid well and retain most of their earnings, rule of law, IP, all of these things. Uh, and now what you're seeing is wokeism, the undermining of rule of law. Uh, they're going to cut for property rights uh in time all of these are downward trending so that premium is now actually overvalued uh long run although not immediately it's overvalued relative to these other stock markets and rating that equities get elsewhere so i i see long term generally a contraction and i don't want to be the guy trying to pick a gem in something that's broadly contracting i want to catch the big waves even if i'm an average surfer and do okay so if i'm saying an etf Instead of, are we choosing geographies for an ETF? I'd prefer a Singapore ETF of all based, all the listings there than an American one. Where would you geographically consider, just if you had to buy the index, which index over from roughly now for 20 years into the future, because you've got a long leaf of life are still ahead of you, would you put your 240, to, if I said you can only put this in a, one particular geographic general index ETF, or maybe I'll allow you an industry if you want it. Um, but that's all you can do. I put a restriction on you. Where's that 250,000 go then geographically? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I have to break down the 250 because I diversify. And number yeah. two, as long as I'm alive, I will take advantage of special opportunities. So, I mean, I don't think that it was uh, anything to do with a great investor, but I turned very positive about the valuations of Hong Kong shares late last year and of Chinese shares. And I think whereas in the US we reached in 2021 a major generational high we reached in hong kong and china a generational low just last october so we have markets that as you know diverged a lot from the us have uh, been in bear market since 2015 if you look up stocks in hong kong 
Some peaked out in 1997 and are down 80-90% from those levels. And I think they're bottoming out and some will come back and some not. But in general, I see an opportunity for the next 12 to 18 months in China. But I tell everyone, there's one big proviso of investing in Asia. If war breaks out between China and the U.S., uh, all the Asian investments aren't going to be good. And I think worldwide it won't be very good for equities. I mean... I don't think it will be a very good, except the military industrial complex again, uh, which would be my wild card. That could be your hedge. So uh, let's say I allow you a split and you split it in half or you split it in three or even five chunks of 50 grand. 50,000 goes into the military industrial complex as your hedge. That doubles or triples. We put it actually in the military complex in Europe because uh, a lot of countries in the world for political reason, will prefer to buy European manufacturers who are perceived by, say, a country like India or China as more neutral than the U.S. Agree. Uh, this uh, is uh, something. By the way, China has a big defense industry, and Singapore has some, not as uh, well developed, but some will come up. But anyway, uh, the other thing is, I w yeah, I agree with the military complex. I agree with uh, some commodity plays and so forth. But during war times, commodities tend to go up. I will own some oil. Yeah. And I would uh, uh, own some uh, shares in a region that which is unlikely to be, be very negatively uh, impacted by war, and that would be Latin America. Yes. I think they will kind of be on the side because the war theater if war breaks out will more likely North. be like Europe, uh, and Central Asia, Asia uh, yeah. Southeast Asia, China. Yeah. Korea, and and, and actually the nations that aren't committed to any global complex, uh, conflict tend to do very well because they sell to both sides who suddenly need a lot of stuff in a lot of different places. So food and oil and all sorts of things. So th that makes absolute sense. So we've got 50k in the best LATAM. We've got 50k out and out commodity, which could be energy based. Uh, we've got 50k in military industrial complex. We'll make pan European, um, and we have three fifties there. We've got a hundred thousand to spend of two more fifties on uh, equity. Where geographically do you want it, and what other industries would you spot? Well, did you list already China, Hong Kong? So China, Hong Kong. We'll put 50k value. So we're going growth, uh, not growth value stocks that are good yield and at very low prices and a recovery play on the China Hong Kong index. I'm not too sure which industries there are. I just get the feeling that that's quite general. Well, so maybe the other day, I mean, I've been saying this, whatever embargo occurs by the U.S. State Department, uh, is a sign that the companies of high quality, you know, what they wouldn't uh, ban uh, American investors from buying such and such if uh, if they were going a, a, a leader. So companies like Huawei and China Mobile and CNOOC, these China Mobile CNOOC are inexpensive stocks because American institutions can't buy them. And this yep. was uh, actually also pointed out by a fund manager who is quite well known at Skagen in Norway. He also said this created a huge buying opportunity for these stocks because institutions in America don't can't buy them. Maybe they can buy them somehow. But in general, this is true that uh, these companies are <laughs> so uh, that final 50,000 can be for any new sanctioned companies that are probably quite useful probably technologically uh, probably good quality products that they fear and they fear IP loss or, or exchange uh, and that they will initially crash possibly on that news because you'll have American flight capital and then you, you bottom pick those names uh, as a as a rebound play. 
Yes, but also I want to point out one thing. Uh, you know, a year ago, one of the favorite markets uh, was Vietnam because people said, uh, oh, companies will move out of China and set up uh, in Vietnam. Uh, to some extent, uh, some companies have established their bases in Vietnam, but the industry in China is so large. The infrastructural exports is so large. In, it's impossible to displace them like overnight. This is a pipe dream of some woke journalist who works for the Wall Street Journal or <laughs> the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, it affects you the world. I was reading Rykard's book and he was saying, you know, I mean, I think 90% of the world's penicillin is made in China. And I mean, the stats he was throwing out about this, you know, it was just, you know, just on individual product lines. You you virtually can't replace the scale. Correct. Of Correct. Anyway, uh, at the same time, uh, more than a year ago, the perception was that Turkey was going to be a lost country. And I'm mm. talking about Turkey here because it's an example that an economy can actually function with 80% inflation. I mean, mm. if you go today to Turkey and to Istanbul and nobody talks about it, you would have noticed that uh, there's 80% inflation. Yeah. You will notice it if you live there. But salaries go up and so forth, and, uh, the, but the business continues. So I'm saying uh, there's a, an option for the Fed to gradually increase interest rates, which they've done, that they've increased sharply, but from an artificially low level. Uh, yeah. In the 70s, at the current rate of inflation, the discount rate was already over 10%. Mm -hmm. Not They're behind the curve still. Or they're way behind, way behind. According to the Taylor rule, interest rates should be close to 10%. But anyway, I would say in Turkey, the last 12 months, the stock market went up 100%. Now, I'm not saying you should buy Turkey. I'm saying the Fed's money printing create overvaluations and undervaluations. Like right now, today oil is weak, but not gas. Natural gas is up. You understand? It distorts markets. The Fed has distorted markets. And not only the Fed, the other central banks with it. But uh, it creates opportunities. And I hold in my bond portfolio a relatively large amount of short dated bonds and deposits because if I can invest my money at 5% this year, and get 5%, I'm happy for this year. Look, the valuations are not low, except in some emerging markets, as I told you. But if the market in the US goes down, it's unlikely that these emerging markets will go up or not. Uh, I own shares, as I said, but I want to have some cash and short-dated bonds. And in emerging market bonds, I see now some opportunities of bonds yielding 6-7%. So, uh, for me, the, the diversification is uh, important because what you say about bonds is absolutely true. I agree with you, but you and I could be wrong. So, I also do certain things because I think I should also do some things uh, in case I'm wrong. Yeah, Con contraindicative. Just on your Turkish equities uh, example, uh, particularly, you know, when you have very strong inflation rates, as they have, actually indebted companies that still have good product and remain with pricing power are actually a very great place because the debt is being devalued at a rapid rate, yet they are passing on price increases and maintaining margins. Um, you actually end up with a situation that companies, providing they're not continuing to add new debt on an ever escalating basis if they if they had if they were hit by the events of march 2020 loaded up on a lot of debt they've been unloved but they are pretty basic and required uh product and have some degree of pricing power 
their, their debt gets devalued. If they hold on to margin power and maybe even, even extend it slightly, they could do exceedingly well because essentially the inflation kills their debt uh, whilst giving them price increases. Uh, and if they hold margin, they hold margin. Yes, in theory, this is correct. But in general, I would avoid uh, countries that have high inflation as an investment destination. But yeah. I have to point out High inflation creates, as in the case of Turkey, or as in the case of Latin America in the mid-80s, incredibly low valuations. Because yes. the currency collapse exceeds uh, the stock market. The stock market may move sideways in local currency, but in dollars it collapses and creates very low valuations. So... It's kind of a trading opportunity. I think some, like Brazil, we have a socialist now in power. Oh, God. I have a great sympathy for him because he drinks a lot. So people <laughs> who drink a lot, they don't cause more damage. But in general, interestingly enough, socialists have been quite good for stock market. In general, they're also bright, but uh, I think Brazil is moving into a buying zone. There are some stocks that are very cheap. The whole of America has many inexpensive stocks. If I were younger at that time, I would go now to Venezuela and pick up some Venezuelan shares. Yeah, oil, yeah. Some good quality oil, uh, as, as best quality as you can get, because that's that's going to come around too. And as you say, currencies crush the valuations, but if they the companies are retained, they're not being cleaned out. They continue to sell and continue to operate. Yeah, sure. eventually, as you say in your Turkish example, people become functional alcoholics or functional inflation economies. They continue yeah. to exist uh, yeah, and they can operate, and uh, they become pretty good value. Uh, excellent. Um, Mark, I've really enjoyed the uh, market that I want to highlight. Last year, Iraq was up 50%, uh, more than 50%. And uh, this Holland, year so far, it's up close to, it's up about 20%. So wow. uh, I think these markets can have a move of 200% very quickly. So I would probably have some exposure to Iraq. Yeah. So the the previous high risk bombed out places are on such low base that you can get some pretty spectacular. Although you might have to watch liquidity moves, so that might yeah. be a need for a managed fund that has most of the liquid yeah. stock, blue chip. Yeah, and Which some probably... assets in Russia are very inexpensive too. Yes, Russia as a stock market, I think, is deeply undervalued because they don't have an investment cult in the citizens. They never talk about shares and investing. It's almost something that strange business people do. It's almost, you know, the, the, the communism era has ripped that from their culture. And as they slowly, it'll take a while for it to develop. But in time, they've got lots of space for PE multiples to stretch. And so much in terms of natural resources. Uh, I also find them. So there's a couple, there's a silver miner I'm watching that's pretty huge that Rick Rule mentioned. Uh, and uh, very, very cheap. And uh, if, if, if we get that move in silver, it might be one of the best equities to have. Excellent. So it's part of emerging markets. Actually, if you have a diverse enough portfolio across these emerging markets, you're going to have a few high flyers. You'll have a few bomb outs. Uh, but providing you don't have a socialist government that actually takes away the assets, um, you should do pretty good uh, over time, especially in those industries that we mentioned. I hope so. <laughs> we Excellent. Have, we in a, in all the gloom, we have to be remain optimistic. We need a cackle and have a laugh, Mark. I've really enjoyed uh, this. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us so generously. Um, if people wish to stay in touch with you and your thoughts, how and what should they do uh, to get your uh, bright brain on their team? <laughs> I should have interviewed you, you know, much more than I do. But uh, I have a website, gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, gloomboomdoom, all in one word, dot com. 
and there people can uh, get access to my reports. I don't know whether they're worth reading or not. <laughs> Still write them. <laughs> Disciplines me to work. That's a good impression. My duty to keep on working. Exactly. And keep enjoying it and keep laughing our way through this amazing clown world that we'll have to. I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I often um, refer, we've used cinema quite a bit in our discussion today, but I, I'm pretty sure you saw the Shawshank, uh, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and, I, and I have a feeling to get our freedom, we're going to have to crawl through that shit pipe uh, all the way and take in everything that's thrown at us. But on the other side of all of that, um, we will stand in the river with our hands in the air and a, a beautiful boat on a, a, a sunny island, a desert island awaits us if we can manage to see our way through that journey in the meantime. Well, I think, uh, you know, people in the Western world, they've forgotten how grateful we have to be, especially my generation. I was born in 46. I never had to go to war and the economy is expanded and uh, I had every opportunity and I have to say not many people in, in the world had the kind of opportunity and luck. I, I was never seriously sick in my life and I always had a job and I was always reasonably happy. I never had mental problems. Oh, maybe some people think I have. That is a, another thing. It's all a matter of perspective. Uh, my wife may have a different view of me, but uh, I think we need to be grateful for what we have. And I'm prepared to suffer if I have to. Uh, I think we can all adapt to a more modest lifestyle. And uh, so. I prefer not to do it, but if I have to do it, then, well, that will be the case. Absolutely. I think we all have lots to be grateful. There's plenty of internal work to do on ourselves personally. Um, and after the darkest night is the brightest day. So, uh, indeed, thank you very much. So that's the gloom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Right. Cheers.